All right, welcome to Big 12 Breakdown. We come your way with the best bloggers in the Big 12 each and every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, 8 o'clock Central. And I talk about it 52 weeks a year. These conferences don't play enough against each other. So we're going to match them up on the Big 4, the Big 12. This week, taking on the Big 10 after a week in which Sean participated in a 20-20 to 20 tie against the Pac-12. So we had three bloggers plus myself. So we had four opinions on 10 hypothetical games with the Big 12 against Pac-12, so 40 games, and we had a dead heat at 20 to 20. Melissa, we needed you last week. All right, so we got Melissa Treeblosser from Frogs of War and also Sean Cordy uh, from Today's You to talk up the combine before we get to our little exercise here. So, Melissa, what did you see last week out of those horned frogs or really anyone from the Big 12 that uh, may have hurt or helped draft stock? Well, I think there were, um, you know, a couple, obviously, big movers and shakers. Um, you know, I think Emmanuel Ogba was already considered to be a, a top player, but he definitely made himself a lot of money with the way that he ran. Mm -hmm. Not surprising necessarily, but uh, I mean, what did he put up? Like a, something ridiculous, like a four six five, or uh, just insane. Like I think he was almost as fast as uh, uh, Trayvon Boykin was. So that was that was kind of nutty. Um, speaking of Trey, I, I think it was a disappointing week for him. Unfortunately, um, he didn't run as well as you would hope. He was the second mm -hmm. fastest quarterback uh, at the combine, um, but he, uh, if he's going to be considered as a wide receiver, he, he really didn't have the time that is going to jump off the page at that position. Uh, definitely one of those guys who it became obvious that he runs faster in pads. Although I do think we'll see him. Uh, cut some of that time off when it comes to TC's pro day um, by all accounts was, was fine in the interviews, but his uh, road to re rehabilitation as far as his image is not quite over yet. Uh, but the two guys that I was really excited about and really impressed with uh, were Josh Doxson, who it wasn't a surprise that he killed it, but he absolutely killed it. And it'll be interesting to see um, as he interviews and as he impresses people with, with the person he is off the field and with a pro day to showcase himself one more time on the field is this a guy that gets in line to be the first wide receiver picked or is he a guy that is going to battle it out with Corey Coleman from Baylor to see who's going to be that number two guy off the board after Laquan Treadwell. But I do remiss not to mention a guy who made himself a lot of money and, and probably guaranteed himself an NFL contract in Derek Kindred, um, TCU safety from a year ago um, who blew scouts away as it was revealed as TCU fans have known, but not a lot of people knew that he played all season with a fractured collarbone. Um, and he never came off the field, didn't miss a snap, I don't think, was was really just the epitome of toughness. Ran a four five one, which was huge for him because that's been the big question. He's he's not a big guy per se at 5'10", uh, but he wasn't particularly considered to be fast either. So he vaulted himself into, I would guess, probably somewhere late fourth, fifth. Maybe he falls to the top of the sixth round, but I, I think he's guaranteed to, to hear his name called during the draft, which for him is a huge victory and, and just a really test, uh, testament to how hard he's worked since the offseason began. Sean, what you see in Indianapolis that caught your eye? Well, speaking mostly for Baylor, I'd have to say it was a really disappointing weekend overall considering these were supposed to be some big workout warriors considering what Kaz Kazadi has done with the program. Sean Oakman didn't run as fast as expected. He wasn't as strong as expected, only 23 bench reps. Andrew Billings was hoping to top 50 reps, 31 is what he ended up with. Huge disappointment by someone that used to hold or still does sell some uh, Texas State records powerlifting. And Corey Coleman, he was a top performer in everything he did. That's no surprise, but he only did three. He's not up to 100% yet from that hamstring injury. So we're going to see what he can do with 40 yet. He was surprisingly strong, something about 21 bench reps, which is incredible for a player his size. He's really showing that he has some extra strength to go at that speed that he's become known for. So once he hits the pro day, it's going to be interesting to see what he actually tops out at, if he can hit 4-3 like Will Fuller did. And that's going to be one of the big things that separates him and Josh Doxson. Sterling Shepard's another one from Oklahoma. Doxson, Shepard, Coleman – we're all top three in the vert or the, the high jump. So that really speaks to how this Big 12 conference stuff has done so far with the passing offense. So not much has been going on. It's kind of disappointing overall. As Melissa said, Boykin was kind of a disappointment. But I'd have to say it was a biggest disappointment for Baylor. 
All right, very good. Now we get to our little exercise here. So you guys know how this works. 2015 team. So you bring them back to the combine. They don't go to the draft yet. And they're motivated. They're motivated to play this game in April in a new site against this week, the Big Ten. So 14 teams out of the 10, 10 out of the Big 12. So I got to take four, and I guess this is the best way to do it, take the four middle teams out of the Big Ten. So no Wisconsin, Penn State, Nebraska, Indiana. So however you rate those teams, it could be a plus or minus for the Big 12 there. Probably comes out in the wash in some direction. So we're going to match up these teams. Full strength. If anybody got hurt, they're back. They're ready to go. Boykin and Doxon on the field for TCU, plus all that defense. Back and ready to go. So so we'll match them up right here, Melissa. We'll start with you with uh, the number one seeds, Oklahoma. May not be the best team in the Big Ten, but they're the number one seed. They won the conference, got blitzed by Alabama in the uh, college football playoff. Of course, Oklahoma losing by 20 against Clemson. Sooners and Spartans. Who do you like in this matchup? I'm taking the Sooners. I don't even think it's going to be close. I think I think we saw what a, a, a pretty good uh, explosive offense can do because Alabama was far more explosive than we gave them credit for, it turns out, um, against the Michigan State team that, that – I struggled with Iowa, who got blitzed by Stanford. Uh, I'm taking the Sooners and Baker Mayfield to run all over the place. Who got blitzed by Stanford? Iowa. Oh, Iowa did, yes. Yeah. Did. yeah. Str good. Struggled with Iowa. Yeah, Iowa got blitzed in the game they were supposedly motivated for. So, yeah. All right, Sean. Uh, Michigan State and Oklahoma. Michigan State's acquitted itself uh, well in recent years against the likes of Stanford and Baylor in bowl games, but uh, yeah, annihilated by Alabama. Although it was pretty much seven nothing at halftime, then they got trounced. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be closer than Melissa anticipates, especially because of what I saw two years ago with the Cotton Bowl game. It's of course different teams right now, but Michigan State's a stout off, uh, defensive team, and Connor Cook. He's, he has his up and down moments, but if he comes out as pro ready as he's looked at the beginning of the year, I think he makes this one competitive, but still Oklahoma is more speed that Michigan State's not used to having to cover. So I'm going to take the Sooners. I have a rough one with this one because I usually put a whole lot of faith in Michigan State. They usually show up for big games. They've got a great record under Mark Antonio in recent years against top five and top 10 teams. I don't think this Michigan State was, team was as good, even though they won the Big Ten and pulled off an upset in Columbus, as good as the last couple teams. They were limited on offense, didn't have the Le'Veon Bell type running back or Jeremy Langford in the backfield. Uh, they had the one great wide receiver in Aaron Burbridge, but he was pretty much uh, the big playmaker on offense. Connor Cook, for as good as he is, he's stuck in the pocket. Uh, if you can surround him and, and corner him like Alabama did, then he has all sorts of problems. I think Michigan State a little too one-dimensional on offense. Oklahoma wins a really good game against Michigan State. That would be my call as well. So Sooners in a clean sweep against Sparty. All right, Oklahoma State, I think most people would agree from both conferences, these are not the second best teams in these two conferences. But the seedings say it's Oklahoma State. They finish second. It's Iowa uh, that played extremely well against a weak Big Ten schedule. They didn't see Michigan State, Ohio State, Michigan. Uh, didn't see the best teams in the Big Ten for the entire season. Uh, so what do you say here? Cowboys and Hawkeyes, Melissa. Uh, this is like a battle of attrition, I feel like. Um, if this is the Oklahoma State team we saw for, after they trounced TCU, I almost go with Iowa here. I mean, that's a, a gritty, tough football team that wasn't great against high-powered offenses. But Oklahoma State struggled as much as anybody in a major conference down the stretch. And what they did against Baylor and what they did against Oklahoma and, and what they did in the, the bowl game, it's hard to have a lot of faith in the team that finished the season, although I would like to. Uh, Iowa was, you know, obviously we just talked about how they got destroyed in the Rose Bowl. Um, but I, they ran into just a juggernaut that was playing their best football towards the end of the season in Stanford. I, I venture to say I, I think the Hawkeyes get this done. Um, I, I think – Kirk Ferentz uh, had a great season and, and showed he can game plan. And she showed, you know, he slowed down Michigan State, played a great game against them. I think he gets it done. And, and I think Iowa wins an absolute ugly, gross squeaker of a football game in that Big Ten style that we all know and love. 
All right, Sean, uh, Oklahoma State limped to the finish. Iowa, not so much, although the final result against Stanford was was pretty ugly. So both teams coming off really bad bull showings uh, in this number two seeded game. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting that we're looking mostly at when they were at their worst. As we saw, Oklahoma State got trounced by Baylor. Iowa got trounced by Stanford. And who's the greater of the lesser evil? And... I think Iowa has a better defense that can shut down uh, Mason Rudolph and try to get in his head a little bit. And as we said about Michigan State, Oklahoma State's incredibly one-dimensional. Can't get a running game worth anything. At least Iowa has Jordan Kanziri to run the ball a little bit. And I'm going to take them in a closer game, and Iowa's defense is just going to be able to be shut down. So Oklahoma State went 7-2 and two in the Big 12. So off the top of my head, they, they beat TCU. That was the one big team that they beat, right? So they got yeah. off to a 10-0 start. Yep. Then they lost the last two regular season games in pretty humbling fashion against OU and Baylor. Got trounced. But the Ole Miss game, that was really bad. <laughs> Iowa had the horrible Rose Bowl, but they played that close to Michigan State. They beat a really good Northwestern team. They beat Wisconsin. I think Iowa showed up against better teams. Uh, they beat a Pitt team that went six and two in the ACC. That was decent. Uh, so I, I'm, I think Oklahoma State's a little more explosive on offense, but I think Iowa gets it done with an offensive line and the defense, and and it's 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 tight. It's a tough one. So I'm going to go with the Hawkeyes there. All right, this is the best Ooh. game of the board in, in my opinion. I think. Oh boy, here we go. I'm saying the best game. I'm not saying I'm not saying the the biggest blowout. Or I I said this is the no, best game. The best game in the undeniably. People would want to see played. Would people not want to see Ohio State and TCU on the same field? That no, would hey, you'll get to game. do that. You get to do that in two years. Yeah, in a few years. In a few years. Okay, Melissa, try to give it your best go in being unbiased in this one. TCU and Ohio State neutral field. Neutral full field. strength. This, this is such a fun matchup because, first of all, you give TCU a defense back, which is something we never saw this team play with at full strength. Um, you give Gary Patterson, who is widely considered, you know, one of the top two or three greatest defensive minds in college football today. You get Urban Meyer, who is widely considered to be one of the top two or three greatest offensive minds. You give them six months to prepare for each other. <laughs> and you pit strength against strength. And it's, it's fun. And, and I think it would be – impossibly close while Ohio state is, I mean, unquestionably the more talented team on the field. If you look at 2015, I mean, I think half of the combine was, was their guys pretty much mm -hmm. or, or something close. I, I'm not exaggerating when I say there was like 75 guys from Ohio state. Um, so it, they, they had the athletes, they had the talent. What we never saw from that team. I felt like in 2015 was that real hunger um, and, and that real drive and that, that need to go out and prove something. <laughs> hey, Gerald, <laughs> um, that need to go. <laughs> I don't know. On the field. Yeah. I don't know uh, there. We're just going to have it. Um, so I, I want to pick TCU with a healthy Trayvon Boykin and a healthy Joss Doxon and a healthy defense and Ranthony Tejada and an actual linebacker playing at the linebacker position. <sighs> It's really hard for me to to pick Ohio State. I, I think it's a nail biter. I think it comes down to last possession. Um, I really do think it, it would be a a field goal at the end to win it, kind of a game. But against everything in my heart, I'd I'd have to go with the Buckeyes. Oh boy, I, I had TCU already written down. I know. In 2014, wow. 2014, I'm picking the Horn Frogs, 100. percent 2015, I'm picking the Buckeyes. 2016. I'm picking TCU. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I got to respect the professionalism right there. Melissa comes through with Ohio State in a. I, I need to go. Game. Excuse myself. I I think I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. So. Wow. <laughs> I'm shocked. All right, Sean, line them up. Whew. I'm gonna play devil's advocate. I'm gonna go with TCU. Uh, God, it's another nail biter. It's a nail biter, and I think that you just you get that last second field goal. There, I was Ohio State definitely the more talented team overall, but you have playmakers that prove themselves time and time again at at full strength. Josh Jackson, Trayvon Boykin, Aaron Green, uh, my X Factor, and uh, Kevante Turpin, fantastic player. Colby Listenby. 
I mean, Ohio State's got the speed too, and so does TCU. I just like what they could do better. I think they have the hunger that you said Ohio State was missing. I'm really curious to see what quarterback would show up for Ohio State. You know what you're getting from Trayvon Boykin with the three plus Braxton Miller uh, playing wide receiver. I just don't know if I can trust them based on the games that I watch. Virginia Tech game, that came down to the wire if it weren't for uh, Virginia Tech's quarterback getting – if it weren't for Virginia Tech's quarterback getting – wire. Not to the wire. It was in the third quarter. 17 in the fourth quarter. <laughs> yeah, but until before he went down, before yeah. he went down with injury. Until he came went, down. Braxton Miller had that ridiculous wire. catch and run. To. And then, it, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, I misspoke. But it was – the tide was starting to turn until he got hurt. And then the Michigan State game. That was a very – that was a game that I didn't see much of Ohio State looking like they could be the national champs repeating as they should have this season. So I'm just going to go with TCU. Close game, down to the wire, but I just got to go with their heart. If I can only see one game on the board, that would be it. TCU, Ohio State. Okay, so Ohio State, if, if they would have made the college football playoff this year, I think they would have won. I think they were that good. They are loaded. They're, they are going to set records for NFL draft picks, possibly in the first round, possibly the first 50 picks, possibly overall. They got like 13 or 14 guys that should get drafted. They are loaded. And when they decided to play, I thought after they lost to Michigan State and the offense didn't show up and the Ezekiel Elliott controversy and only getting 12 carries against Michigan State and all of that, that they would just tank it because they're going pro. But that motivated them. They crushed Michigan, and Notre Dame was not in that game against Ohio State. They they put down the throttle. I think it'd be a great game. I think Ohio State beats TCU. No, man. I'm All right, the deciding uh, vote this game number Ohio four is an interesting one too. What's that? That I'm the deciding vote against my own school. I think I'm going to get kicked out of Fort Worth. <sighs> Ross. Got the Baylor I guy to win TCU. Harold ever makes it in, we'll, we'll give him a vote too. They could possibly tie it up. So, figures this, out. this might be an even more interesting game for a number of reasons. Baylor and Michigan. This would be a really good game. Then it gets a little shaky after that. But our top four is really strong here, Melissa. Michigan, they lost on that freakish play to Michigan State. They got crushed by Ohio State. They lost the opener against Utah when I really don't think that they had put things together. But Michigan was pretty darn good last year against Baylor. Everybody's back, Corey Coleman, Shaquelin Wood, whoever you want to play at quarterback, Seth Russell, possibly. Uh, this, this would be a good one. Uh, I disagree. I don't think it's a good game. I think Michigan was highly, highly overrated. I think the Big Ten was very down this year, um, other than, you know, the Ohio State juggernaut that should have been. But, you know, Urban Meyer can't do what Nick Saban does, and that's bring a lot of talented, egotistical maniacs together and get them to play football as a team. Uh, I think uh, Michigan was lacking a true quarterback, but because you're playing the Big Ten and you can win a lot of games by scoring nine points, it didn't really matter. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going. I'm just going off on Big Ten right now. Um, yeah, you can going to not reply I'm later. Going to run down the Michigan schedule and see where they ever scored nine points, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they may not have never got, ever gotten to nine. That's my bad. Um, so I think a healthy Seth Russell just destroys Michigan. Uh, Michigan had a very good defense. I will say that defense was outstanding. Uh, but I don't think a great defense can beat a team that that would have. I mean, I, I just think that the points they would have put on the board, Michigan never could have matched that. Uh, Baylor still is going to score 30, 40 points against a great defense. They've proven that. Uh, time and time again, e even if they, you know, have, have not won, that's not, they've never been slowed down to that point. Uh, it's just a matter of if their defense makes stops too. And I, I don't think that they need to make enough stops against Michigan. They'll stop themselves. Um, and Baylor rolls big time. Okay, Sean, Michigan Baylor. I thought it would be a good game, but uh, apparently not. No, I, I think Melissa brings up a lot of good points. I'm not going to be that hard in the big 10, but I think this comes down to the coaches style choices. You got the khakis versus the long sleeve shirts. And you gotta go with Browns. But in all seriousness, I'm gonna go with Baylor. Their speed is gonna be something that can run outside all day over Michigan. And it's bad as bad of a defense as Baylor has. They're efficient. 
they play in a Big 12 that's ultra competitive, air raid offenses all day. Mm -hmm. So if they're playing against a Michigan team that can't run that same type of offense, they can shut down about more than 50% of the time. And I'm going to say because Baylor can score nine times out of 10, even on a solid defense like Michigan, I'm going to go with Baylor. All right, Gerald, we'll let you play a little catch up here. So let's start it from game one, Oklahoma and Michigan State. I'm taking Oklahoma. I think they have the better all-around team this year. I like Connor Cook. I mean, I know a lot of people for some reason don't like him right now, but I think he's still a good quarterback. But I'm taking OU in that one. Um, okay. Got to Iowa taking on Oklahoma State, the uh, two two seeds. You know, I want to take – I think I was a good team. I thought they proved a lot near the end, but I think Oklahoma State would be able to pull it out at that one. Um, healthy OSU. I mean, we're talking about the same. Like when they were healthy and they were playing well, they were playing like a top Big Twelve team. But then again, that run game is also worrisome. But I think I will take OSU in this one. Okay, one vote for the Cowboys against the Hawkeyes. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I have to be the one Sorry about that. But uh, we got uh, what uh, I think is a consensus game of the year between these two conferences, at least, Ohio State and TCU. I think I would have to take out Ohio State, honestly. Um, I think TCU is a great team, and I, I've said this plenty of times. If they didn't have all those injuries, they might be in the college. Oh, they got everybody years. back. Everybody's playing. Uh, it's just I, I think Ohio State probably pulls that one out, but – I wouldn't be surprised to see TCU do some kind of magic, come back from like 25 points in the fourth quarter or something. It's possible. All right. And then, and then we get the contrasting styles of the two four seeds, Michigan Baylor. Um, I'm looking at Michigan's schedule right now. And anytime they played a team with a potent offense, um, they didn't win. They couldn't win. I mean, Utah, uh, Michigan State, and Ohio State, all those have offenses that can at least move the ball. And they were just, they couldn't find a way to come out on top. I mean, obviously Michigan State's a little different of a story with that punt, but um, I'm going with I'm going with um, Big 12 in this one. All right. I say Michigan beats Baylor. We got a 2-2 game there. All right. We go to number five, and we've got uh, West Virginia finish 6-6, six and six, then beat Arizona State in the bowl game, 43-42. Pretty much was the mid-team in the Big 12. Lost everybody above them beat everybody below them against Northwestern, which I think most people would think uh, wasn't quite as good as their record showed. Uh, won a lot of games on defense and uh, taking care of the football, but uh, they beat Stanford. They beat uh, some decent teams uh, in the Big Ten as well. Uh, Northwestern finished at 10-3. and three. So, so that's our matchup there, Melissa. West Virginia, Northwestern. I was at that Stanford Northwestern game, um, and I don't know how. I have no idea how Northwestern. I went to Minnesota TCU. Brother-in-law went to Northwestern, worked Stanford, so road tripped it. Um, but we uh, watching that game. I have no idea how Stanford lost that game and how Northwestern won it. Uh, Northwestern is the epitome of scrappy. They're good at home. Great coach. Uh, West Virginia. I don't. I don't know what was up with them this year. It was a weird season. But if you bring back their uh, their their Carl Joseph and and the other guys in the secondary that got hurt, I think they have enough to get it done um, defensively and and can move the ball just a little bit more consistently uh, than Northwestern was able to do. You know, leaning re- predominantly on a freshman quarterback. So I think it's a close game. I don't think it's the most pretty football game in history. But I think West Virginia squeaks it out. All right, Sean, I know you love West Virginia, yeah. uh, but they, they disappointed to a certain extent, but they're taking on a Northwestern team that, yeah, uh, if they let the game get out of hand against a more, much more talented team like a Michigan, they lost 30 to nothing. Tennessee mauled them in the bowl game. They, they were one of those teams that had to have everything go right uh, for them to play their game. Yeah, like you said, the Stanford game, that was a game that everything went right, and that probably should not have happened. If you take these those two teams at the tail end of the season, you would take Stanford hands down. West Virginia, they'd be a team that can make those things happen to make it sure it doesn't go right for West for Northwestern. A team that's solid on defense, but not as much on offense. As Melissa said, if they get those secondary players back, especially Joseph, they're a team that can force a turnover just about every third possession. So I take them, even if uh Russell Shell, Wendell Small would be the ones trying to make up for any mistakes that Skylar Howard would make. I think that they'd be able to 
maintain enough of a uh, rhythm to take over the Wildcats. All right, Gerald. Uh, West Virginia lost six games, but they pulled through in the postseason against Arizona State, one of the better bowl games uh, we witnessed. Northwestern coming off a hurting against uh, Tennessee. You know, earlier in the year, I think it was like week nine, I saw a thing on ESPN that said Northwestern was one of the only three or four teams in the country with an offense in the bottom 100 and still had a winning record. Um, I think that's something that Holgerson and his um, Mountaineers could overcome. And B, I think I got WV in this one. All right. I'm going to buck the trend here just because I think Northwestern played much better against better competition than uh, West Virginia. West Virginia, their best win was Arizona State. Uh, that was a six and seven football team. The Stanford game did happen. Northwestern won that game. They held Stanford to six points. Uh, Northwestern also played uh, Wisconsin, the team that beat USC in the uh, Holiday Bowl. They they had some pretty impressive showings against decent teams. They beat a Nebraska team that beat UCLA in the bowl game. Uh, I'm going to go with defense. I think Northwestern defense is much better than West Virginia's, and their defensive backfield is one of the best in the country. They're very limited on offense, but they got Justin Jackson at running back, who's a 1,300-yard rusher. Ah, very close game, but I'm going to go with the Wildcats based on a track record that's better than West Virginia's. All right, let's dip it down to uh, Texas Tech and Minnesota. Red Raiders made postseason play, so did Minnesota. They both uh, finished, uh, well, let's see, Texas Tech at 7-6, and six, Minnesota 6-7. Six and seven. Melissa. It's, it's a really interesting game, um, and I love Minnesota. I mean, definitely one of my favorite opponent fan groups ever. Uh, they're wonderful, wonderful people. And, and what they did, you know, after they lost Jerry Kill and the way that they were inspired and almost pulled off the big upset there against um, – that Michigan State or was oh, I don't remember who they were playing, but um, they had some talent. And Texas Tech obviously is the sometimes they look amazing, sometimes they look horrible. They were right in it in the game against LSU in the bowl game until uh, that pass got deflected at the goal line, turned into an interception, and then the wall, the doors kind of came off for them a little bit. Uh, it's close. I, I just think Texas Tech is too offensively talented. You're not looking at a team that's either program is really particularly great on defense. Uh, Minnesota is superior defensively than Tech, but uh, I just think Tech could put a lot of points up on that Golden Gophers team and and would find a way to get it done. Okay, Sean, uh, we got a Minnesota program that was awful about five years ago. Jerry Kill did wonders. They became a seven or eight win type program the last few years. Uh, won a bowl game against a MAC team taking on the Texas Tech team that uh, throws it all over the yard with uh, Pat Mahomes. Very different styles here. Yeah, I mean, I think Melissa hit all the points right there. And I'm going to have to say sorry to I have a dozen friends over in Minnesota right now, but I'm going to go with the Red Raiders. I mean, look, I look at the uh, Minnesota's schedule, and every time they play a decent or ranked team, they usually fall really flat, except for against TCU in the opening it was a pretty weak showing for the most part. And Texas Tech at least showed that they can run against the big boys in the Big 12. TCU especially was a tight game. And now, as we know, that if it weren't for that tip, we would be talking about a different game right now. So I have this go with Texas Tech just because of that pure offensive power. I was leaning Tech. You might have changed my mind because you reminded me, you want to, I want to check that Michigan game. They got stopped at the goal line. Would have beat Michigan. True. Played Ohio State within a touchdown. It they, they they play pretty well. All right, Gerald, we'll we'll hit you up with this one first. Uh, two very different teams here: Texas Tech, Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it was Tech. I mean, they're another team that you know they're missing that one thing. Only their one thing is times eleven in the defenders. <laughs> so um, they got they got to find that. But I just and I will disagree with the whole Minnesota didn't play tight and. 28-14 against Ohio State, 40-35 to against some um, Iowa. Obviously, losses are still losses. They still found a way to lose those games. But I, I think that Texas Tech with Pat Mahomes, what they have on offense is pretty good. Um, I think they could probably hang with – I think they could definitely beat Minnesota, probably hang with a couple of those other teams ahead of Minnesota. All right. I'm going to go against my typical logic. My logic would typically be Minnesota's got a much better defense – they played much better against good teams. We mentioned Michigan, Ohio State, Iowa, TCU. They, they hung with everybody good. Texas Tech, though, when you got a team that can throw and catch 
like they can. I could see them getting the ball in the last uh, 90 seconds. And just when you have dynamic receivers and a quarterback that can hit it in tight windows, uh, I see them pulling that game out against Minnesota. So we got a four game sweep for the Big 12, Texas Tech, Minnesota. Would be a good game. Now we really drop down to the bottom of the barrel of the Big Ten. So we took out the middle of the Big Ten, and we got the final five teams in the Big Ten. So we got a Texas Illinois game, Melissa. <laughs> uh, Texas is just the more talented team. Um, we have yet to see them put it all together on the field, but uh, all they need is you know the most important position, and they'd probably be really great if they can ever find a quarterback. So I take them. I don't. I don't think it's much of a game. A double digit win for the Horns. All right, Sean, uh, Texas showed us some things when they pulled it together. Obviously, the Oklahoma game, you could call an aberration, but based on talent, hey, they did it. Yeah, and week in, week out, this goes, that's our de facto response. Texas has the talent. And Illinois, I mean, they were they're surprisingly good considering their coaching situation coming into the year. I have to give them a lot of credit for that, but I'm going to have to go with Texas on this one. All right, Gerald, we got a Texas team that missed postseason play at five and seven, Illinois as well at five and seven. Uh, I think I'm going to take um, Illinois on this one. Um, former Oklahoma State quarterback, Wes Lunt, so, you know, got to have him do something right. But I just – I think they might have been able to pull this one out. Texas Tech was just way too inconsistent for me. Or Texas um, or Texas Tech? Texas, sorry, okay. excuse me. Um, I was reading off that board. But um, I, I, Texas was just way too inconsistent on offense for me. Um, like I said, Illinois. Yeah, I think there's a whole lot of comparison between the talent. Texas is obviously much more talented, but I think Gerald brings up some good points that Wes Lunt uh, brings stability that Texas doesn't have a quarterback. They can bring back uh, their best wide receiver, Mike Dudek, who missed the entire season after having a huge freshman year in the Big Ten. But Texas beats Illinois. I I'm pretty confident in making that pick right there for the Big 12. All right, we drop it down. We're back to postseason play for the Big 12, Kansas State losing to Arkansas in the Liberty Bowl, taking out a Maryland team that was mostly atrocious. Melissa, Maryland and K-State. I mean, are we going to let Diamond Stone and Rashid Suleiman suit up for the football team for Maryland? Because I think that's – I don't really care who they play. Kansas State was not great, but ugh, good Lord, Maryland football was just – almost ugly on the field as there were uniforms were this past year. So I go with uh, the Wildcats. I know I'm just, I've just, it's been a while. I'm just kind of shooting fire tonight. I apologize. <laughs> well, yeah. Once you get down to the bottom of the barrel here, it's, it's tough. Uh, you're pretty much uh, figuring out who wouldn't blow the game, I guess. John Maryland uh, got trounced in the big 10 this year. They won one game. And uh, K-State obviously lost to most of the big boys, although they got off to a pretty good start in terms of competitive games in the Big 12 and hung with Arkansas for three-plus quarters before getting knocked around in the last 10 minutes. And ironically, we got another Oklahoma State quarterback, Dax Garvin, not going to be starting. They're everywhere. Third string. Let's see what Joe has to say about that. But I'm going to go with Kansas State. I, I don't know. Maryland – if they can get their punt returner to get five touchdowns, uh, maybe. But I like what Kansas State would have to bring to the table healthy, especially their secondary, getting back Dante Burnett, Barnett, who was supposed to be a all-conference selection. I really like this team overall. I think that Bill Snyder has the advantage that's coaching-wise. So I'd have to go slightly with the uh, Wildcats. Why can I not think of that kid's name? Anyway, he's at the Combine. Uh, he played yep. cornerback and, yeah, big punt returner for Maryland. But little else for the Turks here, Gerald. Uh, Kansas State, Maryland. All right, so you guys pretty much said everything I was going to say, so I'm just going to throw another little tidbit in there. Um, Kansas State beat West Virginia 24-23. to West Virginia beat Can um, Maryland 45-6. to right. So transitional properties, we're going to – I'm gonna go. Does with that really State. work? It works now. Okay. I mean, that's how that's how life works, right? Don't get me started on transitive properties in college football. <laughs> I can have you work. anybody beating anybody. I mean, TCU beat um, but, Ole Miss forty-two to three. Oklahoma State beat TCU. I don't remember. I've blocked it out of my mind. And Miss Ole Miss beat Oklahoma State. <laughs> Yeah, but we, yeah. I'm surprised that you guys <laughs> thought this long and hard about Kansas State and Maryland. 
right? Well, yeah. Oklahoma State beat Texas, therefore they won Bedlam. True, so. true. <laughs> All right. Kansas State sweeps Maryland. I didn't have to think much about that one. I think K-State's a more solid football team. All right. Yeah, we're getting down to it here, Melissa. Iowa State and Rutgers. I believe Iowa State won one game in the Big 12. Rutgers won one Big Ten game. So. Uh, uh, I don't uh, even know that I can name one player on Rutgers football team, if I'm being really honest. Um, five or six. Yeah, Iowa State has some nice pieces. Really like what uh, Matt Campbell's doing. Um, I, we're assuming he's the coach for these five yes. months. Um, <laughs> Iowa State, like three to <laughs> two, like <laughs> three to safety. I don't know. <laughs> sure, why not? Coach Don, you're gonna have to watch this game. We're gonna make you watch this game. Rutgers and uh, Iowa State. Clockwork Orange style. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go with oh, Iowa State. I mean, I kind of fall in the same boat, with Melissa. Don't really know too much about this fairly new Big Ten team, and obviously they haven't been able to adjust to the new conference within the past few years. Iowa State at least is able to compete, especially with Oklahoma State, for whatever reason. That always happens. But this is a team that has the pieces. Mike Warren is the player that would be able to get this done, if anyone. So I'm going to have to give the, uh, the win to the Cyclones. All right, Gerald. It's getting ugly. Cyclones, yeah. Scarlet Knights. I'm going to go with Iowa State. Um, I don't think they're building anything that's going to be fighting for TCU and Baylor's spot in the standings, but they'll they'll be fighting with Texas Tech and West Virginia next year, I believe. Um, I like what they got at running back. Obviously, it's the new coach. Um, the quarterback that stepped in, I can't remember any of their names saved my life right now. But uh, Rutgers was just an atrocity. They shouldn't have been allowed to play football, sort of like Kansas. So going um Iowa State. We know that Rutgers did play Kansas last year. Yeah, they did somehow, right. and they beat them, and um, so that happened. Right. Somehow, they somebody let that decent program for quite a long time under Kyle Flood. They were winning mm -hmm. seven, eight games. But the last couple of years, it's fallen apart. They did win a bowl game, 2014, against North Carolina. Then they were really bad. They had off the field issues. Kyle Flood got fired. Um, but I'm going with Iowa State anyway. So the Big Twelve wins four straight there against uh, the Big Ten, and finally. The game of the matchup here, we got Purdue and Kansas. Melissa. Poor, poor, sweet Kansas. That's Congratulations on your basketball championship again, Kansas. Um, we're all real sick of you winning that until it comes to football season. We realize it's all you've got going for you. So um, I, I don't know a lot of programs you could name right now that I wouldn't pick over Kansas, sadly. I, they just they don't have the talent. They don't have the skill level. I think they're going to improve. I like David Beatty a lot. I feel bad for the guy. He seems like a really good person. That's just such an uphill climb there. Um, I don't know much about Purdue. I, I saw one game where it looked like it was just a lot of snow on the field, and I think they won. <laughs> Maybe they lost. I'd, after a couple minutes, I'd, my eyes started to hurt. I turned it off because it was such <laughs> ugly football. Um, but I'm going to give the Boilermakers this, mostly based on having a better mascot. Yeah, they do have a great mascot. They do have a great mascot. Yeah, and the Jayhawk isn't even a real bird. Exactly. So. Jeez. <laughs> Kansas. Yes. Uh, Purdue Pete, I think, uh, the boiler guy. It's the boiler yeah. maker. Yeah, with the He's hat. He's super yeah. creepy in person. All right, Sean. <laughs> Battle of the mascots. Uh, I mean, we always hate coming to this spot. I think we should start with the bottom from now on. Now we're here. It always gets to, yeah. <laughs> It always gets pretty depressing towards the end. Uh, if we get Michael Cummings back for Kansas, they might probably get something more out of their quarterbacks. Uh, but as it is, Purdue had a little bit more something. I remember watching the Marshall game, and if it weren't for that game, they may have pulled out another another uh, win in that win column. Uh, it was a pretty rough last few minutes in that game, if I remember right, and their quarterback just kept throwing interceptions. I'm going to have to go with Purdue just by default because of Kansas. Just 63, I think, was their scholarship total, and it really showed. 
Yeah, Purdue threw a pick six. They were about to come back and win that game against uh, Marshall. Purdue actually played Michigan State pretty well. They they hung in some games. I know Kansas did too, maybe two games against decent teams, but Purdue a little bit more so in the Big Ten. All right, Gerald, what do you got, uh, Purdue and uh, Kansas? Let me tell you something about Purdue football. They won two games this year, one of them against a Division One opponent. So that's already two steps ahead of Kansas <laughs> right there. Um, they also kept it close against Marshall, Bowling Green, Michigan State, um, Nebraska, and Northwestern. Kept it within 20 against Iowa. I mean, man, they actually tried to play football this year. So <laughs> I got Purdue over Kansas. <laughs> All right, so a clean sweep uh, for Purdue, I'm hearing. <laughs> All right, 40 games. How many do you think the Big 12 won? All of them. 35. 35. No, I'm kidding. Like maybe like 30. They only went 30. 26 to 14. Nah, yeah. I may have to go change some of mine. I'll take it. <laughs> I'd like to play them on the field. Big 12 one, Mark. Deal All with right. that. What's that, Sean? The Big 12 won. Deal with it. I know. You're all with the Big Ten. Hey, but we want I'm the neutral host here. I just host the show and let you guys chime in. I just throw my pick in there for fun. All right. Well, then we no, definitely won. There's no bias here. All right. <laughs> Fine. All right. Big 12 breakdown. We make up topics even when we don't have any. So we're matching up the Big 12 against the other Power 5 conferences. And this week it is the Big 10. So 26 wins for the Big 12 in 40 games against the Big 10. Uh, that's even with a Purdue sweep of Kansas uh, games in which nobody Kansas. watched. Always dropping our RPI. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. All right. Melissa Tree Blosser from Frogs of War, Sean Cordy from Today's You, and Gerald Tracy, Tracy from Cowboys Right. It's, it's, All right. Okay. it's a hard right. name. Gerald, you were late. So you only get one name. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fine. He's and like share. He doesn't need a lapse. So I, I uh, am allotted uh, mental lapses. All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, jumping in on this, and we'll pick another conference next week. All right. See you. Bye. Right, see ya. Bye. Bye. How do I leave? <laughs> you can just go. Go. What? Did you ask how you leave? Yeah, I found it. Okay. Yeah. Um, you see our new uniforms. Oh, dude, they're sick. Dude, I know. I'm so happy. They're really them. cool up close, but I really wonder how much different they are from afar. They're not going to look too much. I mean, yeah, they're not going to see that much of a difference. I knew it wasn't going to be that big of a change, but um, I was super pumped to see they finally were going to release it. So Yeah, that's cool. That was it was good. I was surprised by it. I like it. But I think people are still watching us, so I'm going to go ahead and go. Okay, I'll see you.